All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Doug Tabor, uh, CCIM, rental housing realtor, of course, with KW Commercial. And I'm delighted to have my guest today, Mr. Michael Campbell, CCIM. I want to have Michael on today because Michael is the managing director of Triple Net Investment Company. Uh, Michael, again, is a CCIM, which stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. Uh, it means he specializes in working with investors. Uh, he is the immediate past president of that fine organization here in San Diego. So, Michael, how are you today? Hey, Doug. I am doing fantastic. It's a beautiful day here in Southern California, and I'm super excited to be on. Thanks for having me as a guest. Awesome. Yeah, it is beautiful. As you can see, I'm hovering somewhere over Balboa <laughs> Park in beautiful San Diego, where it's always sunny and always blue. Oh, uh, that's why we live here. Absolutely. And Sunshine. deal with some of the challenges. That's right. But on that note, there's a lot of great opportunity to invest outside of California. And I think that when people think about net lease properties, triple net properties, a lot of them are considering maybe doing an exchange into a net lease property. And I know a lot of my clients are, a lot of apartment owners that are here in California uh, aren't particularly fond of the political climate, especially in the apartment business. And so a very popular option for folks is to uh, transfer into something that's more passive as far as the management requirement and collect some of that couch income, we like to say. And that's why I wanted to have you on, Mike, because I know that uh, net lease properties are your specialty and your expertise. And so for those that don't really know what a net lease property is, or they don't know what a triple net property is, can you just kind of give us the overview of, of how you explain what a net lease property is? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so a net lease investment ultimately is an investment whereby the tenant is going to pay your property taxes, your insurance, they're going to cover all of the maintenance and upkeep of the property. And so the net operating income or the annual rent is really net to the investor. So uh, unlike a apartment complex or <clears throat> some industrial style properties where they have maybe a gross lease and the landlord is responsible to pay some of those uh, taxes, insurance, maintenance items and a triple net lease. Uh, all the cash flow flows through to the investor. And so you're really getting uh, full cash flow, no landlord responsibilities and, uh, you know, no terrible T's. The terrible T's. Yeah. We talk about those a lot in our other events and, and it's true, you know, quite frankly, folks that have owned, as you probably know, many of the clients that you work with, they've owned for five, 10, 15, 20 years. They're tired of dealing with those telephone calls yeah. and those toilets. Uh, and I think that's what makes the net lease properties attractive. Now, your company is triple net. Triple net's kind of the jargon, the, 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 uh, the kind of the normal title of what these properties are. But what exactly does triple net mean? I mean, is there a double net? Is it a triple net? What does that mean? That's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, we are the triple net investment company. Uh, and, and I would say, as you, as you touched on, really, that's the common nomenclature. But in all reality, there's um, different variations of a triple net property. I mean, you've heard single net, double net, triple net, uh, modified gross, you know, differences in there. So a, a triple net property really is what we consider to be a property that all of the expenses are paid by the tenant. In a double net property, traditionally, the landlord is going to have the responsibility of the roof and the structure. So if there's a leak in the roof, potentially the landlord would need to come out and have a, have a company come out and, and uh, attend to that. But the lease being the you know, governing document really is going to state what specifically landlord has to do and what the tenant has to do. And there are different variations of those. So I would caution anybody to really be able to dig into those facts as you're looking at something and it says, well, it's a triple net lease. A lot of real estate agents use that term loosely. And what you'll find out maybe as you get into due diligence after perhaps you've spent some money on a purchase and sale agreement is that, oh gosh, you know, we've got a roof and structure responsibility here. And if you're really trying to avoid that, it's good to know that upfront. Yeah, that makes sense. So who's in, who writes the lease? Does, does someone buy the property and then they have to secure a tenant and, and write a lease or is that generally in place? 
Traditionally, for most of these investments, the lease is in place and solidified already. It was either an agreement between a developer of the property or the owner of the property and the tenant. In some instances, uh, you can buy it what's called a sale and lease back where the property is actually owned by the tenant itself. Uh, and there's an opportunity maybe to make comments to that lease. Generally, I would say, um, the lease is set, it's in stone. So what you're gonna to wanna to do as part of your due diligence is really go through it with a fine tooth comb and make sure you understand all of those provisions because ultimately the lease is the governing document that's gonna tell you uh, who pays the taxes, uh, when the rent comes in, what happens if the rent is paid late, you know, when the tenant has to notice you about an extension, things like that. That, that brings up a whole bunch of other questions and, and I'm trying to bring, get this really down to a, uh, you know, a, a layman's level, which I'm the perfect layman for these questions. <laughs> so uh, with regards to leases, a lot of these, a lot of these net lease properties are with big corporations, you know, Starbucks or with CVS or with Pizza Hut, big organizations. I'm assuming they already have their set lease that they like to use. And does that mean that you come along as the independent investor that you should really, when you mentioned due diligence, how should you analyze that lease to make sure that there's nothing in there that's really obviously one-sided? Sure. Well, uh, as many leases as I've read, uh, you know, thousands of them, um, I still recommend that each of my client uh, hire an attorney because ultimately um, I am not an attorney and uh, every lease is different. Now, the, the big corporations in the big franchisees, they always do, they, ha they have form leases, but um, in, each, uh, in each deal or each lease, um, everything is negotiable. It's a real estate deal. So there can, there can be changes in provisions depending on who negotiated them. Uh, so I always like to say that, you know, let's hire an experienced real estate attorney uh, for the price that you're gonna pay. You know, oftentimes these properties can begin at anywhere from, you know, $500,000 and go up to, you know, many, many millions of dollars. So a uh, two to $5,000 investment is typically really worth it. And then you're getting a second set of eyes on all of these provisions, all of the legalese and things of that nature. So we can really kind of mitigate any risk that we're gonna have. In terms of other due diligence, you know, you really wanna just take a, a, a kind of an overview of the property and you know, use your common sense and say, hey, look, does this tend to make sense for what the tenant is and who they are? So if I'm buying a, a Taco Bell, are they in a shopping center or close to residential area? Or are they in a primarily industrial area where perhaps at you know, four or five o'clock, business shuts down and really there's nobody in the area. So those are the things that you're really gonna wanna just take a look at. You know, does it seem to make sense? Is it good real estate? Um, things of that nature. And I've got a long list of those items that, you know, we kind of check off. Um, but I don't want to get too deep in the weeds in that. So that, that brings up another question. You know, these are commonly called single tenant. Uh, is there a double tenant? I mean, is there multi-tenant net lease or is it typically you want to stay away from multi-tenant because it might be more of a headache and you focus simply on single tenant? I think there's two different, um, you know, dis decisions to be made there. So, over the past, I don't know, five or six years, what we have seen is we've seen these two to three tenant buildings coming up where the leases mimic triple net leases. So the tenants are paying their pro rata share based on their square footage of taxes, insurance, common area maintenance. But in each of those instances, the roof and structure always kind of comes back to the landlord. So inevitably that makes it a double net deal. Um, the investment strategy there is just a little bit different, right? So you tend to get a little bit better of a return on a on one of these deals, the multi-tenant deals. Um, if one of the one of your tenants leaves, you still have income coming in, so you know that's a positive thing. You, if you take a mortgage out, you can obviously continue to pay all or a portion of your mortgage. Um, they tend to be able to increase rents a little bit faster, so you might see a little faster rent growth, but you do take on some responsibility. So for those investors who say, you know, I'm comfortable buying a corporate kind of bonded net lease property, let's say a Walgreens or a CVS on a 20 year lease, 
Uh, I, I'm not worried about them going anywhere. They've got strong corporate credit <clears throat> and I can kind of forecast out what the next 20 years of my income is going to look like. I feel comfortable with that. I don't want anybody calling me in the middle of the night or, or reaching out because something's wrong. So they're, they're just two different investment strategies. I don't think one's better than the other per se. It just depends on, you know, what each person wants to do with their portfolio. Along those lines, as far as the, the actual tenant themselves, do you typically recommend only a corporate recognized, you know, kind of national brand? Or, I mean, if you're talking about multi-tenant, to, to be lucky enough to say have three corporate tenants may not be common. So what do you generally steer your, your clientele towards as far as the best decision there? Yeah, it, it's, that's a, a very hot topic right now. Obviously we're, um, you know, we're kind of post COVID um, still waiting for a vaccine. The buzzword a couple of years ago was Amazon resistant. Now that's shifted and it's Amazon and COVID resistant tenants. Right. Um, and so, you know, traditionally, I have been a proponent of corporate tenants. Um, and the reason being is that when you, when you have a lease that is executed by a corporation, that, that lease is typically held along with all of their other leases in, 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 an, in an entity where if for whatever reason your location wasn't performing and they had to shut it down, they would be able to draw off of all these other properties to be able to kind of pay your rent. And you often see that where a CVS or uh, a fast food restaurant has shut down, but they continue to pay the rent. That's the benefit of buying one of those properties. And it's often why they cost more money than a franchisee deal. Um, now, there, that doesn't mean that there's not strong franchisee operators out there. Um, certainly what we've seen in the past couple days from you know, today is Ruby Tuesday declared bankruptcy they're going to file chapter 11 and they're going to reorganize. What does that mean to you and me? It means that there's still going to be Ruby Tuesdays uh, available to eat at. If that's your favorite restaurant, they're not going away. But what it means is they can go onto their balance sheet, get rid of their bad debt, reorganize their leases with their landlords. And it kind of gives them an opportunity to just shed all that bad money that they spent. Rent's too high. Hey, we're happy to renegotiate with you. But if this doesn't work, we're going to leave. So there is a little bit of a double-edged sword here. We have seen a shift away from some of this casual dining, which has been hit particularly hard by say COVID where you know, no indoor dining, only outdoor dining, things of that nature. We have seen uh, post really the, the worst of it that uh, store sales have really begun to increase. And, and in some instances, I looked at a property today, their sales are back up to pre-COVID numbers. So again, you know, it's a, you want to just make sure that you're doing your homework on who they are. Uh, corporations can be run poorly. Franchisees can be, you know, poor operators. So if you're asking the right questions and you're doing the due diligence, you should be relatively safe in the long run. Uh, I will mention that CCIM had an article posted uh, a number of years ago where they tracked a number of corporate and franchise tenants and none of the corporate tenants defaulted, but only like 2% of the franchisee tenants defaulted on their payments. So in general, you know, really small risk probability, as long as you're doing, again, that basic homework to make sure that all the fundamentals make sense. You brought up location earlier, you know, should you be in a, a residential neighborhood with a Taco Bell versus an industrial, obviously, you know, it's, it, it seems like if you're dealing with a corporate tenant, their MBAs that they have on staff that are doing their market analysis are going to not necessarily put those locations somewhere where they're not going to be able to sell tacos. Uh, I mean, do you have to, as a buyer, really go that deep into you know, that market analysis to find out about if that Taco Bell is going to survive or just like other real estate? Is it location, location, location? Or do you get the sense that that should already be covered by whoever built the property if it's a, if it's a corporate tenant. So I, I think real estate is always about location, 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 hands down. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, all of these corporations have very sophisticated real estate departments. I mean, you know, you hear stories about McDonald's for instance, and you know, they're a, arguably the world's, you know, number one fast food hamburger chain, but really they're a, they're a real estate company. I mean, they own the majority of their real estate. Uh, 
and which makes them one of the largest property owners in the country. So these companies have, you know, very robust uh, real estate departments, but that doesn't mean that they're always right. And so uh, when, in terms of location, what I try to look for is I try to make sure that the, the properties that we're seeing are going to be in a growing market, not a declining market where people are moving away from. Uh, I, tr I try to make sure that populations are large enough to support the business. I try to make sure that if something is really to go wrong, right, then what we're able to do is kind of reimagine what the second coming of that property might be. And in a really small market, it makes it much more difficult. In a robust market, if you're on a good corner and there's good uh, traffic counts and visibility, you're most likely gonna be, be okay. So, so those are the things that we really, really wanna try to find out and, and understand. Um, you know, traditionally, I always try to stay in what we call major metros. That would be like your Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, San Diego, uh, or secondary metros, which would be the smaller outlying cities right outside of that. So Scottsdale, or, uh, you know, you think about like somewhere in Dallas, like um, Frisco, which is a really growing bedroom community of Dallas. S not necessarily Dallas MSA, but it is, uh, it is a fantastic area to be. So when you see the you know, the, the more remote properties with the greater returns. Are you sitting down with the client typically and finding out, you know, what their return requirements are and then deciding on location? Uh, are you, you know, almost like a stockbroker, you know, depending on the amount of runway that client may have in their investing future, are you looking at those types of, uh, you know, characteristics of each client because maybe they are apt to take a little bit higher risk for a greater return? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say, you know, the beginning process of, uh, of understanding what a client wants really is the idea that we should sit down, we should talk about, um, you know, for somebody who, let's say, was exiting um, a single family investment portfolio or maybe a multifamily portfolio, let's talk about, you know, what did your net income look like? What are you looking to replace? And then from there, we can kind of come up with an idea of where we need to be in terms of return, um, perhaps uh, where we need to be in terms of one property versus two versus three to kind of spread some risk out. And, you know, oftentimes what happens is I call it a little bit of retail therapy, right? We need to look at a couple properties, have some education across the board to really understand what's available. And then once you start to dig in and understand the risk versus reward factor, you really get an idea of what makes sense for you. And, and my tagline, if you will, is always, let's make sure that when you go to bed at night and your head hits the pillow, you're not concerned about this property. And in order to do that, we want to check off certain boxes. And a lot of times that means we're going to buy a corporate tenant. Got it. Understood. So we've talked a little bit about what a triple net lease or a net lease property is. We've covered that, I think, pretty well. Um, you know, how it works, uh, who buys it, typically folks that are going passive, uh, some of the pros, some of the cons. What, what should someone expect? You know, if someone's getting ready to sell their portfolio of apartments, or as you said, single family properties, uh, when you sit down with a client, what do you generally tell them? look, these are what your expectations should be. Because a lot of times folks, they have no idea what, you I mean, they hear triple net, they've got brokers calling them all day long trying to get them to buy these properties. I mean, what's the reality of the, of the net lease business that someone should consider when they're thinking about going into it? Yeah, I would say for my average client who is, <clears throat> you know, probably, you know, mid fifties on up, um, they're towards the end of their risk taking investment career, you know, so, so what we are really providing, I think what the opportunity is, is to, to buy into a, an asset that's going to give you a solid return, capital preservation. Hopefully we've been able to buy something well located. So it's going to give you some appreciation and just peace of mind. Hey, you're going to get this rent payment scheduled out for the next 10, 12, 15, 20 years. I, I can set this and forget it. I don't have to worry about it, but it's not a get rich quick type property scheme. You know, if you, if that's the route you're trying to go, 
then you're going to be looking for shorter term deals, taking on more risk. Uh, and, and that's, that's possible, you know, real estate is a, is a vehicle for wealth, but in this term, you know, this is really your, your long-term kind of bond that you're buying into. You understand it. You don't have to worry about it. And it's a great opportunity for you to be able to pass wealth down to your heirs. And, and so, you know, a lot of times that's exactly what's happening. Somebody's selling, you mentioned it earlier, uh, these apartment owners, single family owners here in California, the last 20, 30 years have just seen this incredible increase in appreciation. Um, and so now they've got these properties that are really very valuable and they have this opportunity to be able to exit from them now while the real estate market is hot and trade into a, a passive investment that should provide them with uh, ample cash flow to sit back and kind of just cruise into their senior years and then be able to pass those assets down to their kids. And with the step up in basis, basically, you know, they get a nice sweet deal where they have no basis when they get the properties. Sure. So they pass it on to their kids. The kids uh, get the step up in tax basis. And we won't go into that. If you want more information on that, check out one of our other webinars, Exit Strategies, or uh, talk to your CPA. Your CPA, Absolutely. also your real estate attorney. You know, your, your real estate agents are there to give advice, but you really need to speak with your CPA and your attorney yeah. to make sure that you're getting That's all where the disclaimer advice. comes across on the bottom. Yeah, I don't have one, but that is the verbal disclaimer. Yeah. Uh, so we, we kind of talked about what your average client looks like. Is there a default rate on these? I mean, I always get asked, you know, how it, it, it's very difficult for folks that have been investing and dealing with these properties for 20, 30 years to, you know, roll their whole nest egg into a property that they're no longer in charge of. And some of them, that's very difficult, you know, to release that control. Is there a published default rate or, you know, in your experience, obviously that's a, a concern or amount of properties that go dark. How do you address those concerns? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, in reality, uh, all real estate is inherently risky, right? Um, and, but at the end of the day, the default rate is, is relatively small. And the, uh, you know, 12 plus years that I have been, a, you know, practicing real estate agent, uh, I've really only had one deal that's gone south um, where the tenant just closed his operations and walked away. Generally, you find it's a marriage of, uh, you know, landlord and operator working together in harmony. Your interests are aligned and you're working towards the same goal. Um, but there are bad apples out there and, and the due diligence that you do on the front end and the reason you hire a professional to help you mitigate those risks is so that you don't end up in that situation. Uh, so I, I would say in general, you can feel pretty comfortable that if you've got somebody who's really looking out for your, for your best interests, you're going to come out of this, uh, you know, looking really good. And, you know, cap rates or, or year one returns for most of these properties is, is really kind of pretty steady. I mean, right now we're in an environment where, you know, some of those returns have been compressed a little bit. Um, but in general, I think if you look at the history of net lease properties, you know, they hover from, you know, I, I'm in contract on a deal about 3.5% right now, up to 10 or 12%. And the reality is that most of the deals probably happen between, you know, five and seven or 8%, whether you're in a fantastic market or whether you're in the worst market. Yeah, that's, you know, the, the idea that it's stable income, I think is what folks are really attracted to. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if something did happen, they still own a piece of real estate, right? That's right. They still own that box. Um, I don't want to cover two areas before we jump off and then we're going to have you before we do that as well, give your contact information. Uh, touch briefly on, speaking of ownership, do they own the land underneath or are they leasing that land? How does that process work? So that's a, that's a great question. <clears throat> when you're buying real estate in the triple net world, there's really two opportunities you have. You can buy what's called a ground lease. The other opportunity would to be buying a land and building investment. And the real distinct difference between the two is that in a ground lease, the tenant has oftentimes, more often than not, built the improvements or the building that's situated on the land. And because they own those improvements, they paid for them, they have the opportunity to depreciate the asset on their taxes. So if you buy a ground lease, 
you are a fee simple owner of the property. However, you do not have the ability to depreciate that asset on your taxes. So somebody coming out of uh, another investment, maybe in a 1031 that really needs depreciation, a ground lease probably wouldn't be the right fit for them. Now, a land and building deal or investment is where you're buying the land, fee simple, same, uh, but you're also buying the building itself, meaning that the improvements you're purchasing, you can then depreciate that on your taxes uh, and get you know, a little boost in return based on that. Um, pros and cons of the two. Ground leases generally have lower rents because there's less involvement from a developer to have to amortize building costs into a rent. And so generally ground leases are easier for first time investors to get into because it's less capital. Also in a ground lease, your interests with your tenant are pretty aligned. They just spent 500, 750, maybe a million dollars to build a building. They probably wanna recoup those dollars. In a land and building deal, you have the opportunity to, <clears throat> to depreciate the asset because you do own the improvements um, and you own the building outright. Um, really, you know, from that standpoint, you have the ability to set the rent at a market rate, much higher rent. So you're probably going to have a higher price on that. Um, and it gives you a little bit more variability with rent control. So they're both great opportunities. Each investor will just have to decide which makes more sense for them. A lot of my clients have various pieces in their portfolio to cover those things. Got it. So th they shouldn't shy away from one or the other if the terms are right. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so, um, because um, they both have benefits to them, and it just depends specifically on on what you need. And I, you know, even for somebody who has a little depreciation recapture, if you found a strong opportunity with a ground lease, you might be, you know, you might take that over a land and building opportunity where maybe the rent is actually higher than you think would be replaceable for a market. So there can be a number number of different con considerations. Um, and we can go into that a little bit deeper, maybe on, an, on another call, but that's really the two main differences. But in either case, you do own fee simple ownership to the land. So you are the property owner. Got it. You know what, that, your, your comments keep bringing up other questions, which is good. It means we're learning. Uh, really quickly, if we're talking about a 1031 exchange client, you mentioned uh, that there might be some uh, defer, uh, but there's probably gonna be some debt there. Uh, right. What's the lending market like for a, a net lease property right now? Yeah, so um, lending market right now is 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 pretty strong. Um, you know, I would say for your average corporate tenant with ten plus years, you know, I'm kind of underwriting my deals at, at around four point two five to four point five percent. That's on a conservative basis. I always want to be conservative. Sure. The, the reality is is that the debt form is probably lower than that. Um, and, and, and to be clear, if you're coming out of an exchange, you'll either need to do one of two things. So you'll roll the existing debt from your relinquished property forward, and you'll need to replace it in your, in your, um, your new property or the new purchase. Or if you're lucky enough to have that cash on hand, you can replace that debt with cash and go buy a property all cash. In either event, you'll need to replace the total purchase price of your relinquished property with the same value or more in a new purchase. Interesting. So yeah, they can not take on the additional debt if they want to infuse more cash into the transaction. That's right. If you've got uh, some money sitting on the sidelines and you can replace that, you're able to do that. Interesting. And, and what about timeframes? I just got off the phone with a client and they thought, well, we have 135 days after we identify up to three properties. How long does it typically take to close one of these properties? on average? So uh, an all cash deal, I would say you can be in and out of escrow as quickly as 30 days. I'm in a 30 day escrow right now, 21 day due diligence, nine day close. Um, and, and that's probably pretty, I would say on the shorter side. Um, but for an all cash single tenant deal, that's not unrealistic, right? We can, we can kind of get what we need to get done in that three week timeline. Um, 
if we need a survey, we can get a survey. If we need a phase one environmental report, we can get that. Sometimes the sellers already have those because they're new construction. And so we can just have them recertified to us. If you're getting debt, traditionally I have said in the past, you know, 45 day contingency is kind of what you need. I've kicked that out right now and I'm asking for 60 days. So we would put a 60 day financing contingency in place and then traditionally another 15 to 30 days to close after that. So realistically, you know, you're looking at, I would say 90 days with financing. Now, if you wanna really look at the bigger picture, let's say that I'm engaged by um, an investor, well, we've gotta go find a property, right? And so uh, that could take, you know, uh, a week to three or four weeks to find something that we really, really, really like. Uh, negotiate a LOI, negotiate a purchase and sale agreement. So in total, I think you're probably looking at anything from, uh, you know, two months to six months to be able to get something done. Well, wow, so they need to really get ahead of it. If they're planning on doing an exchange, we can sell the property most likely right now with the demand we have, thank God, uh, within two weeks to 45 days. So if they're really considering doing a net leasing exchange as an investor, you should probably be literally talking to you the same time they're talking to us on Absolutely. the sales side. So the down leg should have a conversation. We should also have a conversation on the up leg. Well, Mike, that's great information. Speaking of which, what's the best way to get a hold of you if someone that's watching this is interested in more information, which I have a bunch more questions. I'm sure they do as well. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. So the best way to get a hold of us is probably through the web. Uh, again, our company name is Triple Net Investment Company. It's actually NNN Investment Company. And on the web, our website is nninvco.com. Uh, my phone number and uh, email, everything are on the website. You can uh, see our track record. We've got some case studies that you can review and some best practices as well. Perfect. And we'll, we'll go ahead in the uh, description down below. We'll put all your contact information for the web site. And finally, Mike, we didn't get to our case study, but we kind of got a sense, I think, of, of what the uh, typical client is. And if you have those on your website, that'll be good. Or maybe that's reason for us to have another one of these conversations, which yeah, I always absolutely. enjoy. But on closing, what would be the number one piece of advice you'd like to give someone that's interested in purchasing a net lease property? The, the piece of advice that you love to give all your clients? Well, I think we touched on it right here at the end, you know, really, which is, I think uh, the idea is get started early. Um, you know, once you go into your exchange, you know, you have a finite amount of time to identify your properties. And so my recommendation to most clients is that when your buyer of your relinquished property goes non-refundable, you generally have about 30 days before you're gonna close escrow. That's a free 30 days that we really can be out making offers. And the idea being that in a timeline, if we had an offer accepted within that 30 days, we had a 30 day due diligence, then we'd be closing uh, you know, maybe 30 days after that. And so that extra time is, is really paramount. Short of that, really, we talked about it before, do your due diligence, hire a professional, ask the right questions, uh, and, and you'll come out of it on the other side with a smile on your face and, and you'll be happy. Absolutely. That's the goal, right? Absolutely. Smiling and happy. <laughs> Michael Campbell, Triple Net Investment Co. Again, we're going to put your information down below. Thank you for being on Rental Owner Insights. Always great to have you on, my friend. It was a pleasure. Take care, everybody.